I need somebody to, to respond to this and tell me what I need to do because your girl need to tell. What's up, y'all? So earlier today, I was sent this video by my brother, Bobby. It's entitled Dating in Your 40s by Crystal Renee Hayslet. I hope I'm not butchering your name, but um, yeah, I, uh, I watched a little bit of it and I had thoughts. So I wanted to revise it um, in a similar way that I revised the Meet the Perrys video. It's an interesting conversation that she brings up, but I also <laughs> would like to add additional male context to some of the things that she said. So if you're a young woman watching this, if you're a seasoned woman watching this, uh, if you're a young man watching this, hopefully I can add some color to this to this conversation. So I'm going to stop it periodically and give my thoughts. Let's go. Hey guys, and welcome to this episode of Keep It Positive, Sweetie. I'm Crystal Renee, and today we are talking about dating in your 40s. And when I think about dating in your 40s, the first song that came to mind was Destiny's Child, Independent Women. I'm a woman, independent, throw your hands up at me. <laughs> and when I think of that, it's because I feel like once women um, get to their 40s, they're in a, and they're still dating, they're definitely independent. When you're dating in your 40s, there's so many factors that come into place. Um, your biological clock is ticking. Um, society has put so much stress on, you need to get married by this age, you need to start having children by this age. You know, there's been a lot of conversation about women who are a bit seasoned, you know, women over the hill or who've hit the wall, as it were. And, um, you know, some people believe that there must be something wrong with them. Um, other people believe that they are in their prime. And I think it really just speaks to the shifting societal landscape generally, right? Back in the day, it was customary to get married, start a family in your 20s, right? Um, but you were also pretty much guaranteed a job. Real estate was a bit more affordable. You could look forward to a pension. Um, the world as wide as it as it is, wasn't necessarily as accessible. So you were content in your city and your town. However, as we're moving into the 22nd century, that's no longer the case, right? People are prioritizing education, men and women. People are prioritizing status, wealth, accumulating material possessions. And when your priorities are those things, um, it's very easy to put off those traditional milestones, right? Like it's very easy to look up and now you're 40 or 30 something or even 50. And those traditional things are not there. And unfortunately, because we have so many options, because we have so much access, uh, it's actually made things more difficult when it comes to finding partners or even finding friends. It's hard as hell as an adult to make friends. So I, I guess I would say to women dating in their 40s, it is kind of fair for men to be concerned about why you are still available in your 40s. It's not to say that there is absolutely something wrong with you, but it is to say that from a male point of view, it's a fair assumption. And this dismissiveness that we often kind of meet that with, I think it's really counterproductive because the reality is, you know, as great and fantastic as you might think you are, um, if your son, your 20 something year old, handsome, successful son came to you and he, instead of introducing to you a young, uh, supple, <laughs> uh, young lady, who's intelligent and, and all those good things that he could potentially have children with, he introduced to you a woman that was your age or a woman that was significantly older than you, you would have an issue with it if you were being completely honest, right? So when you think about it from that vantage point, it's, uh, it's a bit easier to empathize with why men are a bit apprehensive. And obviously, you know, there is a conversation about the 
biological clock, a man who wants to have kids, knowing that you can't give that to him, it kind of eliminates you from the running. But the other thing too, even for men who might not be interested in children is the baggage, right? Like uh, reasonable men understand that all people come with baggage, all women come with baggage. Uh, however, we also understandably realize that it's different coming with <laughs> five years of baggage versus 10 years of baggage versus 20 years of baggage. And if you are a woman in your 40s, you have seen a single woman in your 40s, you have seen a significant bit of life, a significant bit of experience. And that is now life and experience that your male partner now has to navigate. You know, your triggers, you know, your sensitivities, Maybe even, you know, an ex-lover that you had that was the best thing since sliced bread. But in 20 years, you might have been able to accumulate more than one of those guys. And now he has to measure up and constantly compete with that. It's fair for men to kind of be apprehensive and uh, not necessarily be so gung-ho about a seasoned woman. And this, you know, assumption that it's because we're intimidated... I think it's a, it's a trivialization. I think it really cheapens this conversation. Men aren't intimidated. We're just, uh, we're a bit more reasonable than uh, we give ourselves credit of being. I found myself attracting like 20 year olds. And I was like, what is this? I know I don't look 40. <laughs> that was the first thing. I don't look like I'm, how old I am, but I was attracting young people. And with that, it became a stress because I knew they wanted children. I'm like, okay, these are conversations we have to have. And I always wanted to date somebody that's either my age or a little older. And honestly, they'd already had children because I didn't want that pressure. I, I don't want the pressure of, okay, if he wants children, I can't give him that. And another thing that's really hard about dating in your 40s is for me, is um, finding a man that's not intimidated. Of course, I want someone who has something going on with, for themselves. Of course, I want somebody who um, can do the things for me that I can do for them, but it doesn't have to always be on the level that I do it because that's not, not what I need you for. I need love. I need affection. What's difficult sometimes about these conversations is, you know, when you, when you sit and listen to certain women describe their ideal guy, um, a lot of times they're describing a girlfriend, not a not a man, right? They're they're describing traits that would traditionally be found in women, right? And they revert back to this whole, you know, I'm coming across men who are intimidated by me. But then it begs the question that why aren't you able to attract the men who wouldn't be, right? And I've talked about how some women are actually more secure and comfortable in relationships where the power dynamic is more in their favor. And they might not actually admit it, but some women actually find themselves more comfortable around men who make less, men who are less intelligent, men who are less accomplished, because he's easier to control, right? He's easier to manipulate. He needs you. You don't need him. And I think that's actually worth a conversation as opposed to this blanket, men are intimidated by me. And then the other thing is she looks good for her age. She looks really good for her age. However, the reality of men of a certain caliber, men of a certain status, as she put it, men who wouldn't be intimidated by her, their priorities are different, right? Um, to, to men of that caliber, a beautiful woman is a dime a dozen. You know, a successful woman is a dime a dozen. Their priority list would include a woman who can provide them with legacy. Right. A woman who's good at all the things that he's not. And, you know, I use the sports analogy all the time. If you're a quarterback, you wouldn't be enthusiastic about your team drafting another quarterback. You would be enthusiastic about your team drafting a wide receiver. What I see a lot of women doing in their critique of men is they are expecting us to value in them the traits that we have. And I think they miss a lot of times that we're looking for a woman with the traits that we don't have, right? In a company, the relationship between the founder and the co-founder might be stale, but I guarantee you the relationship between the CEO and his executive secretary 
might last a lifetime. Because again, this myth of the boss couple, the power couple, it's not sustainable, right? We, we need somebody who's a compliment, not a reflection. I need someone that is emotionally supportive to me, someone that, is, that supports my career. And I've, I've found that a lot of men are not in a space um, of maturity or even have the bandwidth to give me that. They're so used to just buying women and, oh, I'll go do this, I'll pay for this, and everything's gonna be okay. No, like I need some, like I need you to be my homie, my lover, and my friend. I think it's also worth mentioning <clears throat> if we, for instance, were watching a video about a guy complaining about his horrible experience in corporate America. Right. Every job that he's had, his boss didn't like him. His co-workers were shysty. Customers were against him. I think we would safely assume that maybe you're the problem. Right. Why? Why? Why are you the common denominator of all this dysfunction? Why is your operating premise that companies are run poorly? Maybe if your resume was better, you would be able to be recruited by, land a job at a better company where you're making better uh, money, better relationships, or maybe, again, you're the problem. Maybe the company culture was fine, but you poisoned it. Maybe your lack of self-awareness is the reason why you continue to replicate dysfunction everywhere you go. So similarly, when I hear certain women complain about how quote unquote men are, men are intimidated, you know, men aren't this, men aren't that. It begs the question, why are you incapable of finding men who do not fit those assumptions? Is it because, again, you can't attract or retain that caliber of men? Or is it because you're more attracted to some of the more entertaining aspects of toxic men, then you are put off by the bad parts of those men, right? So, you know, I like the fact that this drug dealer, he spends money fast, he's entertaining, but he's also inconsiderate. He's also unreliable. But I like the entertainment so much, I'm willing to put up with the unreliable. And then when I go and talk about men, I say that men are unreliable and men are inconsistent. And I further muddy the waters and tarnish the brand of black men. And similarly, you know, men do this as well. You know, I've seen brothers who every girl that they they've come across cheats or every girl they've come across as a hoe. And it's like, brother, if you were a better dude, you'd be around better people. Point blank. And it's time we start taking ownership of the role that we play in the people that we keep ourselves around and the people that we enjoy being around as well. One of the best dates I ever had, I was living in DC and this was when The Devil Wears Prada was out. Anybody who knows me knows I can quote The Devil Wears Prada from top to bottom, like I love that movie. And we, um, I had never taken a train ride before so we took the train from DC to New York he took me to um, Nobu 57. And this is like when Nobu was like just starting to pop because it was in every rap song. <laughs> so like it was like, oh, we want to know Nobu tonight. So we went to Nobu. And then the next day he took me to see The Color Purple. After the play, he took me to Smith and Lewinsky, which was um, the restaurant that Meryl Streep had Anne Hathaway go get her lunch. And when she brought it, she goes, oh, I don't need it. I'm going to have lunch with Demarchier. And she was like, pissed. So she takes the plate and throws it in the um, sink and the plate cracks and all this stuff. So we t went there, we got the exact same steak that uh, Meryl Streep had ordered or that Anne Hathaway had ordered from Meryl Streep. And I was like, this is the most thoughtful Valentine's Day I've ever had. And probably still one of the most thoughtful weekends. Somebody's like really planned out for me. And then we got back home. He bought me my first Louis Vuitton bag. And I was like, okay, yeah, this is great. <clears throat> and then I found out that he was a scammer. <laughs> uh, I think she goes on to say he's Nigerian too. Uh, shout out to my Niger brothers. So 
this is for the ladies. Part of the reason why it seems like so many men are shitty these days, right? There's a an abundance of future archetype men, an abundance of fuckboys, is because, as you can see in this story, those men tend to be the most memorable. When you ask women about their best experiences, their worst experiences, it tends to be stories of their experience with shitty men. And unfortunately, the good men, the men who would have been good long-term partners, good fathers, tend to be forgettable. So when young men are watching this play out socially, what it tells them is that it is far better to be memorable than to be good, right? And unfortunately, I think women don't consider love bombing. (laughs) I think women don't consider sustainability because the reality of it is any man who is going to be so enthusiastic about throwing the kitchen sink at you without even fully or even appropriately getting to know you, either number one has a whole bunch of money to blow that might have been ill-gotten money because that money is a lot easier to blow or this man is trying to buy you. But again, since a lot of our women grow up watching reality television, romance uh, 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 movies and romance novels, the idea is the man who is willing to do the most for me, the man who is willing to give me the most extravagant most memorable date is the man who loves me the most. The man who's able to excite me the most is the man who loves me the most. And the reality is not that. Because as a Nigerian, I know brothers. (laughs) How much you need me to spend? Oh, you got a 90 day rule? Okay. I'll wait 90 days. And day 91, I'm out. So again, ladies, if you're not focusing on substance, if you're not focusing on sustainability, but instead you're focusing on games. Instead, you're trying to find the highest bidder for your time, attention, or your punani. You'll continue to be used as an object. Because again, there are some men who take pride in conquering for the sake of conquering. However long you need him to wait, however much you need him to spend. A matter of fact, he'll hire a professional date planner to to give you the most extravagant experience you've ever had in your life. And because you're so blown away by the, the, the pageantry of the experience and you didn't focus on y'all's conversation, you didn't focus on the synergy, you didn't focus on shared values, you didn't focus on asking yourself the question, is this somebody I would want to be stuck in the house with during a thunderstorm where there's nothing else to do and we're bored. Because that's, that's what life is like. You can fall in love with anybody who takes you to Dubai. You can fall in love with anybody who takes you to Nobu or buys you a bunch of expensive shit. That's easy. But real life is mundane. And again, because we're not prioritizing sustainability, my fellow Nigerian brothers will continue to win. Because since women are treating their love, affection, and their attention as a commodity, We'll pay, and then we'll treat you like somebody we paid for, especially when that post-nut clarity sets in and those rose-colored glasses lift and that makeup comes off. And when I already smashed and I know that uh, eh, this, is, this, all this, this is all this was, but again, women aren't thinking about this, so we'll continue, we'll continue to see men who are just paying the cost to quote-unquote be the boss. And the other thing I'll say, too, is like we talk a lot about how men have men are immature. Men won't grow up, you know, men in their 40s act like children. But the reality, a lot of women have Peter Pan syndrome as well. A lot of women still think they're princesses. All right. Shout out to Maggie, the substitute teacher. She said that whereas men tend to see themselves in young men, women tend to see themselves as young women. So basically, there is still that little girl in most women. And in a, in a way, it's a beautiful thing, right? That youthful exuberance and things like that, that youthful energy. But in other ways, it's ridiculous and it's immature. 
you have 50 year old women who are still waiting for their Prince Charming <laughs> to ride in and with, with his white horse or white Mercedes real estate in Aspen. And he's got a beach house and a lake house and a ski resort. And he has no kids and he's successful and he's mentally stable and he's the best sex you've ever had. And it's like a lot of that stuff is super immature, but we don't think about it that way because we live in the culture thanks to marketing, that you could have it all. You don't have to quote unquote settle. And not only can you have it all, you are deserving of it all because you're God's gift to everything. Now, when you start saying it out, it does sound narcissistic. At best, it's solipsistic, right? It's that first player energy. Mine, mine is coming because I'm owed it. Regardless of who I am outside of myself, how I'm perceived by others. And it's not until you grow up and you mature that you realize that you aren't owed shit. And what you get out of life outside of some bad circumstances like we see in third world countries, what you get out of life, especially in a Western context, is what you deserve and what you put in. How you make your bed is how you lie in it. And for older women, for instance, to expect the same outcomes of their 20-year-old counterparts is the definition of illogical and immature. If you live in, the, in Atlanta, we know there's a lot of scammers. And most of them are of African descent. So he had this African friend who um, he's like, he owed him some money. And he's like, hey, baby, can whatever his name was, put this money um, in your account. So I was like, sure. So I wake up one morning and there's like, no, oh, I wake up and there's like a million dollars, a negative million dollars on my bank statement. I'm like, a negative million dollars? I'm like, first of all, I'm working for the government. I know I ain't making no million dollars. I'm like, and what's, who, who pulled out a million? It wasn't saying negative. So um, I called the bank and they were like, oh, that's because there's a fraud alert on your account because the money that was deposited the other day was actually stolen. One of my biggest pet peeves is someone who doesn't tip well. Judge me if you want to, but I feel like when they're, are people in hospitality, um, you should take care of them, especially if they look out for you. And especially if I'm taking to, because I made the, I actually set the reservation up because that was another thing. I was always having to set up everything. I'm like, Bro, dog, like, can you do anything? Like, what is going on? Like, I don't understand that about men who, like, don't, it's like the courtship has been lost. Like, how men used to like send flowers. We're gonna talk about that too. I mean, how many used to send flowers, um, make, take time in advance to set up, hey, I want to take you out um, on this day. They wait till the day of, like, oh, what are you doing tonight? There's no initiative anymore. This goes back to the Peter Pan syndrome that I believe an unfortunate number of women have. Part of the reason why certain women aren't having certain outcomes with men is because men understand that Dating these days is really just a performance, right? It's, it's really just an NFL combine. It's really just how much can I entertain this woman and make her feel like she's living her own private movie and make her friends jealous? <laughs> but for an uncomfortable number of men, there doesn't seem to be anything to gain from it, right? So after we are done with humoring ourselves with this show, right? We move on, right? And we go perform at another theater. I remember a brother, I think also a Nigerian brother told a story about how um, he sent a young woman that he was dating money to get them food. And she shows up with groceries and change. And he talked about how that blew his mind. Whereas most women would have just taken the money and you know, bought some bullshit and fed herself and brought back some for him. She took initiative and she saw the bigger picture of this is going to save money. This is going to be the healthier choice. She added something to his life. Unlike other women who are just there to be entertained and to be pleased and to enjoy all the benefits that come with men and the worshiping that comes with us. She actually saw enough value to him in him to want to bring value to him. So when I see some of these stories of women telling their negative experiences with how men weren't good enough tap dancers, 
it, it really makes me uh, sad and annoyed because if if that continues to be your barometer, man A was a great dancer, man B wasn't. Hey, we're getting, just going to keep spitting out really good dancers who ain't good at shit else. But what they're good at is making women fall in love with them, making women come, making women's friends jealous, helping you take good pictures. But when there are no lights, when there are no cameras, when there's no action, I really hate being around this, this person. But again, that Peter Pan syndrome doesn't allow you to think past your nose and past your hedonistic desires. Just consistently let me know, hey, babe, I see you, I hear you, and I feel you. And when he did that, I was just like, okay, this is crazy. I was like, you're not my guy. You can go. Like, I'm not applying the pressure like day one unless I really, really like you. Um, <laughs> I'm like, is you my husband or my cousin? Because I need to know. What are we doing? I am big on referrals. I really do not like meeting strangers. I want to know somebody that knows you to vet, to be like to vouch for you and say, okay, yeah, this person isn't crazy, or he, this is his past. It's what he's been through. I need a little, a little backstory, background check on you. But it's definitely a situation where I'm open. I had to get. I used to like to stay in the house all the time, and I was like, Crystal, you're never gonna find a man if you don't leave the house. But y'all, even that, even just getting ready. Putting the makeup on, doing your hair, finding an outfit, just going to shop for an outfit because you feel like I don't have nothing to wear. And then you get out there and nobody approaches you. I think what's interesting about this, she previously complained about only wanting people who were in network with people that she's in network with. Right. So she could vet and she could authenticate the individual. And now she's complaining that when she goes out, random individuals do not approach her. And again, it, it betrays a sense of entitlement, right? It, it betrays a sense of I am deserving of and should be expectant of certain outcomes, right? Maybe people aren't approaching you because you might have an unfriendly demeanor or disposition, maybe you don't look as attractive as you might think that you do, right? Uh, maybe you're not going to the right places, right? There, there are several things that um, factor into that. But at the end of the day, like you, you're not entitled to any outcomes. And this goes for men as well, right? A lot of men think, oh, because I make six figures, because I'm six foot, because I have a six pack, six inches, all the other sixes that I... I'm entitled to a woman. I'm entitled to a bad bitch. And it's like, it doesn't work like that. Right. And I, and I think there's a great deal of humility that we need to reintroduce back into individuals. Right. And when you have that humility, you can then start to make the necessary adjustments to get the outcomes that you want. Right. You're, you're not a perfect person just because you think you are. Right? You're not God's gift to anything, because in that case, everybody is, which means nobody is. So there needs to be some humility. There needs to be some self-awareness, some introspection. And maybe then you, you'll get maybe not even the outcomes you expect, but better outcomes. And I let people know straight out the gate. Listen, if you're not intentional, I'm in a very intentional space in my life right now. I, um, I know what I want. I know what I'm ready for. I know what I bring to the table. So when you come into this table, I need you to understand, ain't no half-assing, ain't no like, oh, I'll call her when I want to call her. I'm going to carry her any kind of way. Certain times, like in, in my 30s, I feel like I had a little more grace or I, I feel like I put up with more because... I wasn't as secure in who I am. Some of that Peter Pan syndrome. <laughs> because the reality is the intentional men are already taken. They're already gone, sweetie. All right. The intentional men, they got married in their 30s, you know, in their 20s even. All right. Now what's going to be left is either men who are younger than you, who definitely can't be intentional because they haven't even created a life for themselves. They haven't become the man that they need to become, right? So they're, they, they, they're not, and they shouldn't be expected to expedite that process in order to appease you. 
Or you're going to have the men who, you know, tried and failed. Let's say he's a divorcee, you know, or God forbid, a widower. He might not be as enthusiastic about jumping right back into another marriage, right? He might want to take his time to fill you out, especially if he's a divorcee. Take his time to fill you out. Maybe get some of the uh, midlife crisis out of his system. Get back out there and, you know, see if he still got it, right? So he, he might not necessarily be wanting to rush the process. Or you're going to have the men who are similar to you who waited, right? And they waited until they were 40 to get married or, or settle down. And those tend to be either the guys who... They ain't got no hoes. They're the nerd type. They're the, they're the ones that a lot of our women, unfortunately, have been socialized to see as boring, right? Or you're going to have the forever playboy, right? The guy, I'm never going to get married. I'm going to be out here pimping until I'm in a wheelchair. So unfortunately, as a woman, you make, as a woman who is seeking monogamy, you make things incredibly difficult for yourself when you approach, hit, and cross this wall. And again, it's important to be aware, right? It's important to be aware of that. So maybe you can start making adjustments. You can start making accommodations, right? Because it, it doesn't mean you can't still win or you can't still find what you're looking for, but it means that you have to be far more exceptional in the ways that men think are exceptional <laughs> than you've ever been in your life. And again, this goes for men as well. But the easiest way to look at it, this goes for athletes, right? It's hard as hell to get into the NFL. It's so much harder to get into the NFL at 30 than at 22 because the NFL prioritizes young athletes straight out of college. Their bones, their knees are still fresh, right? They can still take more physical damage and physical exertion. Whereas the 30 year old might only have two years in a tank. So again, I think women and also men need to shift their perspective instead of just limiting it to your own confined perspective Think of yourself from the perspective of the consumer. In user experience design, we talk about end user research, right? I, I, I'm not making this product for myself. I'm making this product for an end user. So I have to be able to understand and articulate what the end user values and what the end user needs and what solves their problems. Not what, not what I think solves their problems, what, not what I think they should need, not what I think they should value, but what they actually value. Because if the competition does a better job at articulating and listening to the end user, the competition will be more successful. But if we continue in our community in particular to say that the end user needs to listen to me, <laughs> I want a man, but I don't care to listen to men. <laughs> I want a woman, but I don't care to understand women. You continue to lose to the competition, whether that be younger women or foreign women. And for men, whether that be players, white men, <laughs> sugar daddies, pimps, futures, you have to be able to take notes from the people who are winning at the thing that you want to win at. We're not married, but I don't want you, I want you to be monogamous, um, exclusive. I want you to treat me like your wife. And I want all the, all the rewards of a husband and we're not married. I'm so glad she brought that up because I've been talking about that forever. A lot of women expect husbandly treatment from us from day one while simultaneously bombastically withholding wife treatment from us until we make you our girlfriend, we put a ring on it, whatever her prerequisite might be. And it's not until this new movement of men speaking up, men actually expressing themselves honestly, unashamed, that men are starting to push back and say, no, I have the right to have expectations of you as well. 
And if you're unwilling to come to this proverbial table in earnest, in good faith, just like you're expecting me to come in earnest, in good faith, we ain't got really nothing to talk about because you can't expect me to assume that you're a good person and you're benevolent and you're going to do right by me in the whole nine while simultaneously preserving your skepticism of me. So either we both going to be skeptical and both going to move with caution or we both going to be nose wide open because this idea that heartbreak hurts women worse is bullshit. This idea that men are apathetic and unfeeling people is bullshit. We're not as emotionally expressive. We're not emotional exhibitionists in the way that women are, but we feel too. We lose too. And I know some people minimize that and say, oh, you just lost money. No, I, I lost time. Not just the time it took me to earn that money, but the time that I spent on you and the time that's going to be necessary for me to get that money back. So yeah, either we're both going to act like victims or we're both going to be brave and authentic and unafraid in our pursuit of partnership and love and the whole nine. But this one-sided, asymmetrical deal where you're expecting me to be my Sunday best, whether or not it's sustainable, while expecting also me to assume that you're capable of the moon and the stars if I can only break through your wall or this trial period. Because a lot of men have gotten to the other side and realized that she wasn't shit. She wasn't just not cooking because... I hadn't earned it yet. No, she just can't cook. She doesn't cook <laughs> and was using that as an excuse. So I'd continue to be my, my version of Prince Charming. I had a lot of relationships where it was off and on. And whenever he called back, we, we were back on. We'd fade out and then I would do what I was doing. He would do what he was doing. And then he'd call and say he missed me. And it was like, okay, we back, you know? I had a guy that I did that with for like six years. It was like off and on, off and on. And um, to this day, it's funny. They're like, you know that's your husband. I'm like, no. They was like, well, he still ain't with nobody. And I'm like, yeah, because he got issues. <laughs> he has commitment issues. And um, I was like, that's not my husband. I think, again, it speaks to how we're expecting men to be better when better is not what's rewarded. So in her example, there was a guy who was non-committal, and they maintained a situationship on and off for six years. Now, let's say young men are listening to that, and they just watched their homeboy, who was co committal, get cheated on, right? Their, their smart friend who doesn't really get played like that because women see him as boring. But the exciting, charismatic dude, he gets to be non-committal for six years on and off. And also, he's the one that you remember. <laughs> what do we think the next generation of young men who on top of that are being raised by some of these single women, what do we think they are going to be like? It's going to be more of the same. So they're going to be just like their charismatic, non-committal, unreliable, inconsistent dads. Because Mr. Johnny, who was all those things that at 40 you now realize were important, Mr. Johnny ain't getting no play back in the day. Who got play was my deadbeat dad, quote unquote, that now you complain about. So guess what these young men are going to gravitate towards being like, especially in the absence of older men who can give them a more nuanced version of the game and teach them that they need to play both sides <laughs> in a way. They need to be consistent and reliable, but also adopt some of those enigmatic, charismatic elements of the terrible men. So again, I think women need to grow up on the macro and consider how their actions and how their choices incentivize what we see more of, especially from men. Let's just say this, I put up with a lot of shit that I would not put up with now. And that's because I don't have the tolerance. I have zero tolerance for lying, cheating, um, for inconsistency, for someone who 
a deal breaker for me is someone who's not like a man of God who doesn't want to go to church. Like I need somebody that I can do everything with. Again, Peter Pan syndrome. Women are looking for girlfriends, not men. I want somebody to do everything with. Real men who have things going on. And in your example, he should or could already have kids, maybe an ex-wife, maybe multiple children. He's not going to be available to be your one and only friend <laughs> where you guys do everything with each other like you could have when you were 20 years old in college. So again, it's your big age. <laughs> the priorities should be a bit different. <laughs> right? It should be you know, going into the twilight of your life, somebody who you can be comfortable with. You guys can travel from time to time, get your affairs in order, you know, grow your real estate portfolio, mature adult things, not somebody you can do everything with. You have female friends. And then I hear this whole man of God thing over and over and over again. And it's bullshit, because if that was true, the, 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 the drummer and the pianist in the church is actually a good dude. And he's ready to get married. He would be the one getting scooped up. But again, those men aren't exciting. They're not spontaneous. They're not all those other things that actually matter more than whether or not he's a man of God, if you were being honest. But the man of God thing sounds so good that, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say it. But on my priority list, it's not top five. Before I get to man of God, I'm going to get to bullshit like height and beard and, you know, chocolate or light skin or six figures or six foot. So let's, let's be honest, ladies. You're not looking for a man of God. That would be a nice, nice to have, but tell the truth is you're not making distinctions <laughs> between the men that you fall for and that you're smitten by with whether or not he's a man of God. So again, the male delegation who's actually paying attention is noting that, okay, these are the things that she says matters. But when you look through her history, when you look through the, when you observe the enthusiasm with which she talks about certain experiences, Man of God doesn't come up. Consistency does, doesn't come up. <laughs> Honesty doesn't come up. So ladies, you can't continue to say one thing, but do another and incentivize another and expect us to not be paying attention. I need somebody that's like, baby, we gonna pray together too, because we got to keep this thing tight. And um, that for me is like one of the biggest, biggest things. I always say when people are like, what are you looking for in a man? And I always say, I want a man that has to seek God to get to me. When they see me, they're like, ooh, I can't go about the same way I didn't win it with all these other women. I gotta go with this woman, different. Lord, help me secure this because I know if I do it, I'm gonna mess it up. I need you to seek him first before you step over here, okay? Secondly, um, how he treats his mother. I want him to like, if they, my mother always said, watch how a man treats his mom because that's how he's gonna treat <laughs> That's another one, I think it's fair. You know, I think that's actually a good tip uh, based on how a man treats his mother um, is a good indication of how he sees women and how he'll inevitably treat you. However, why doesn't that rule work the other way around? Is it fair for men to say, watch how a woman treats or talks about her dad? I imagine it wouldn't be, right? Because we see an uncomfortable number of women running with the stories that their moms told them about how trash of a father that she decided to procreate with and how that shaped her perception of men at, at large and what men are deserving of or what men are worth or what men's role is. Now, what happens if men earnestly started making distinctions between women, especially in our community, by how she thinks about, talks about, and treats her father? Or whether or not she has one. I think there might be some protests there. So maybe we should introduce a bit of nuance with the how he treats his mother piece as well. Because I think, you know, in our community, it's a foregone conclusion that everybody had a terrible dad and everybody had a wonderful mom who was just doing the best she could despite less than ideal circumstances. But the reality is not that clean. Some of our mothers are trash and some of our fathers were just doing the best he could. But I don't know if we're ready for that conversation. I look at how he is um, around his friends, the, friend, the company that he keeps, um, how he is when I bring my friends around, because a lot of times you can kind of tell when you bring them in different environments, you're like, okay. That's another one that doesn't work the other way around. We've seen women sit and defend their whole ass, conniving ass, sneaky ass friends for days, but 
now claim that it's fair to distinguish a man based on the company he keeps. I actually agree with it. I think it is fair, but I think it works the other way around. So when I hear women talk about, well, just because Jessica's a hoe doesn't mean I'm a hoe, more than likely it does. And if it's going to work this way, if Jamal is a scammer and I'm his friend, I might be a scammer too. <laughs> if Rebecca's a hoe and you're her friend, you might be a hoe too. And it's not an unfair question or unfair assumption. I dated this one guy and um, he was Muslim. And um, my parents were so mad. They were like, you are that's unequally yoked. Like you, sh you um, shouldn't date somebody who's not Christian. And I was like, and this is really kind of what changed my view on religion, but we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and I was like, but nobody's ever loved me the way he has. Be because of the way, the, the way he made me feel and the way he loved me, it started to make me think that religion was just put in place to give people rules to live by. Fellas, it's important that we understand that unlike men, for women, looks is not as fixed. I've seen women find objectively unattractive men attractive and objectively attractive men unattractive. And what I mean by that is charisma for women, energy, vibes, you hear it phrased in different ways, is far more important. Status even, right? Like we'll see some women ogle over a celebrity who before he was famous could walk by and nobody would care. Or you see women put objectively handsome men, bone structure, muscle mass in the friend zone because he's a dweeb. So going back to the entitlement piece, um, I think especially when it comes to getting women, it's not about box checking. It's all about how you make her feel, right? And that starts with an understanding, kind of a baseline understanding of female psychology. It comes with listening, right? Being attentive and giving her permission to be her authentic self, you know, sweatpants, chilling with no makeup on. I found that women want to feel seen. And part of the reason why some women gravitate to shitty men is because those shitty men give them permission to be their shitty selves <laughs> if, if they see themselves that way. Whereas a more Carlton type of man makes them feel like they need to continue to perform just like they have to at school or just like they have to in corporate America. And later on, when you're hearing about these two opposite types of men, if you let her tell it, the the guy was objectively more attractive. No, he just made her feel more or better. And then with the religion piece, because I had a conversation with a female friend of mine who also was dating a Muslim man. And at the time they were dating long distance. And, you know, <laughs> we tend to trivialize different things because we want to create the reality that we that serves us. Right. I want to believe what's going to be in line with the story that I want to tell myself. But the reality is um, with religion, for example, religion shapes a great deal of our thought process and our lifestyle choices. And although like a Christian and a Muslim might be able to make it work in the short term, what happens when you guys have to now have the conversation if, if kids are part of this deal? How are we going to raise our kids? What are we going to be doing on Sunday? What are we going to be doing on, uh, on Ramadan? And not to say that it's impossible to make these things work, but it's very, very improbable. Especially if you're a solipsistic person who's used to things going your way. And as she put it, I want somebody I can do everything with. A Christian isn't going to be able to do everything with a Muslim. A Muslim isn't going to be able to do everything with a Christian or a Buddhist or a Hindu. So again, when we maturely play these things out and consider these things in the long term, we see that they won't necessarily work. And it's not enough that you want it to work. And it's not enough that love and feelings, those are short term things. Is this sustainable? Honestly, like I used to want like the hot boy, you know what I'm saying, that had it going on, the most popular, even from like high school, I always dated like 
the star of the football team. College, I played it, um, dated the star of the basketball team. Um, and then I, it was a phase of my life where I started to attract like dudes that was making a lot of money. And I got, I was in college and that was when I was exposed to like my first like millionaire boyfriend. And I was like, whoa, this is a different life. And being exposed to that at a very young age was like, it was a lot. And I started to even look at me and like, okay, yeah, I just want somebody to take care of me. I had that mentality because I didn't have nothing going on. But when you when I started having something going on and the table started turning, I was making my own money, I was standing on my own two feet, I didn't have to depend on him to pay my bills, I could do it on my own. That's when I started looking for different things in a man. It's a lot that comes with that life. And you deal with infidelity, you deal with ego, you deal with um, a lot of loneliness because they're always busy. Um, and those are things like, okay, do I want that? Like, is this the life I want? Do I want to be by myself all the time while he's out doing God knows what? This is why I used to defend Kevin Samuels. God rest his soul. Did I agree with everything the brother said? No. I obviously have a different approach. But I think one of the covert things that he was trying to explain to women during some of these interactions was... You do not want what you think you want. You do not want what comes with it. And unfortunately, part of a lot of people and women in particular is Peter Pan syndrome is they only think about the benefit and they don't think about the cost. If you want a German luxury car, it's great. It's awesome. People are gonna be jealous of you. Have you thought about the car insurance? Have you thought about the maintenance costs? Have you thought about how much an oil change costs? Have you thought about what it would cost to replace the radiator if it goes bad? Have you thought about if you live in a city like Atlanta, like I believe she does, how now you're an exceptional carjacking or break in target? But again, if you only think about how beautiful the car looks, when you're confronted with the not just the cost of actually getting the car, but also the cost of maintaining and, and dealing with what comes with the car, you might realize that that's not actually what you want. And similarly, a lot of these women we're seeing wanting bosses, men who make six figures, seven figures. I've heard some women even say eight figures. They do not consider what comes with that life because again, part of this Peter Pan syndrome is I can have it all. That man who is exceptional in every way and rich and everything, he's, all, he's gonna have all the time in the world. I'm gonna be the only woman. He's gonna love me unconditionally. He's not gonna be a narcissist. He's not gonna be competitive, but he is a top 0.5% earner and, and different things that when you start listing it off, doesn't actually make sense. But unfortunately, I think a lot of our women and girls go unchallenged in some of these asks. Because in real life, there is something called a Faustian bargain. There's essentially a deal with the devil. For every benefit, there's a cost. For every challenge, there's a benefit, right? So it goes both ways. But wisdom is the ability to consider both sides. And while considering both sides, you can then ask yourself, do I want a high value man or a high quality man? Because those aren't necessarily the same thing. And sometimes in order for that man to accumulate value, he had to compromise his integrity. And in order for the other man to maintain his integrity, he had to relinquish or turn down things that might have made him valuable. But again, little women, little girls don't think about these things. We just see this guy's shining. It means he must be a better person. This guy's handsome. This guy's rich. It must mean he's, he's more hardworking. He's more ethical, whatever the case may be. And the truth is actually very often the opposite. Um, because he feels like he can because he's the one bringing all the money in. So when I started making my own money, I started my whole idea of what I wanted in a man started to change. And not saying that my success defines me, but I'm not going to sit here and lie and say that it didn't boost my confidence and make me like, I don't need you. You know, I can do this on my own. I want you. And there's a difference between needing somebody and wanting somebody. Can I learn from you? There's guys that like literally can be top NBA players that like, Crystal, I will marry you tomorrow. And I'm like, bruh, the conversation's horrible. Like, I'm a sapiosexual, you get me here, 
you're going to get me there. Okay? <laughs> you got you to gotta get the mind first. And I'm like, every time I'm on the phone with you, I'm like, a man that's hollering at 40-year-old Crystal needs to come with some confidence, um, some swag. He got to come knowing, like, I need to see that you know that you can handle me. Because if I don't feel like you can handle me, I'm like, okay, I'm about to run all over you. You know, in some of my case studies, I've talked about this unfortunate paradigm in our community where we hear women say, he needs to handle me. He needs to know how to handle me. Oh, he couldn't handle me. And, you know, simultaneously, we see female rappers, for instance, including Stallion in their name, right? Meg Megan the Stallion, even though a stallion is a male horse. But it's, it's, this, it's this sense of black women are this wild, unruly animal that needs to be tamed, that needs to be handled, that needs to be manipulated and controlled, or else that animal might buck. That animal might hurt you. And I think, unfortunately, for the same group of women to be asking for our protection, uh, we're going to have to have a conversation. Right? Because if, if we continue to champion this paradigm of, I shouldn't expect your cooperation. I shouldn't expect your soft demeanor. I should expect you to be unruly. And I should measure myself by my ability to handle your unruliness, but I should simultaneously protect you. It's not going to work, right? Especially as the world opens up. You guys know I'm not a fan of passport bros, but... Women of other cultures are not championing the fact that they're going to run over a man. They're not, they're not prioritizing a man's ability to handle them because they understand that that energy will attract a certain type of man. Going back to my first point about those men who are gamers, those men who are matadors. <laughs> you pride yourself in being a bull, you will attract matadors. So maybe instead of being so comfortable and at peace with the unruly aspects of your personality, maybe ask yourself if those unruly aspects are productive and if they help or hurt your chances of creating the sustainable, long-term, peaceful relationship that you now see value in in the latter part of your life. Come to me single. Don't be having a whole bunch of stuff going on, okay? Some scragglers, go ahead and let them fall by the wayside before you come over here, because I need you to be open to receive all that, your blessings that God has for you, because I'm a blessing, okay? <laughs> I need you to know, I'm a blessing. I talked to this guy for a year and didn't know what we were doing. And when I finally asked him, I was like, so what are we doing? I know guys hate that question. It's like a or they hate that we need to talk and they hate that what are we doing? It's like, dun, dun, dun. Women who are used to unintentional men, if they were encountered with an intentional man, it would scare them off. It's, uh, <laughs> it's fascinating and hilarious at the same time because you hear those same women complain and demand that the next man that they're going to be with is going to be intentional. But their track record is the complete opposite. And typically... Those women are more comfortable with unintentional men because intentional men might make them feel insecure, might make them feel unworthy, might make them feel uncomfortable. Hold on, why, why, does, this, why does this guy like me so much? Uh, this, I'm not used to this. And like I say, and people might not like this, but I think especially as you get older as a man, focusing on the positives and everything that's great isn't the best way to make decisions, right? You need to know what the challenges are going in. And I was talking about this the other day, like, you know, when I was teenager, or, you know, 20s, I'm only 30, but when I saw a beautiful woman, I just thought, damn, I wonder what it would be like to sleep with her. Or I wonder what it would be like to take her out. Or, you know, those surface level things. But at this age, 
my first thought is, what's wrong with her? <laughs> what baggage does she come with? What challenges might we have? So then if I'm making a decision, I'm making the decision based on, am I willing to sign up in spite of the challenges? Am I willing to thug it out <laughs> and see it through and commit myself to her despite some of her shortcomings? And I think that's how men need to make decisions. I just like the car analogy. Forget what the car looks like and how fast it drives and all the cool gadgets on the inside. What's the insurance? What's the maintenance cost? How many shops in my area actually work on this model? That's what men need to be thinking about. And similarly, it's important that women are aware <laughs> of their challenges as well. So they can work on them and also be uh, more transparent with the guy so he knows what he's getting himself into. And once those rose-colored glasses wear off after, you know, you guys have sex, you know, he's considered if he wants to stick around past that. But if we remain in this unaware stage, then we are asking, why, why did he stop calling me or messaging me after we slept together? Why did he lose interest or why did he ghost me? Well, because he had one idea of who you were and found out that it wasn't that. Or maybe he just wanted sex and maybe he thought he wanted more. But once he got sex, he realized he didn't want more. Pastor Darius and um, Pastor Shamika say collecting data. I was like, it ain't that much data to collect. I showed you in three months what it was. If you didn't catch it, you didn't catch it. And I'm, I'm gonna speak that. My next man, I'm not even gonna have to ask him because he's gonna tell me. And he's gonna let me know, baby, this is what it is. I got you, we in this thing. My parents got engaged within six months and they were married by the eighth month. So like, it was a very fast track uh, marriage. And my mom always says, it don't take nobody um, that long to figure out if they want to be with you or not. Now, I will say that I go back and forth to this. Some days I want marriage. Other days I want a life partner. Um, there's been a time where I wondered if I just wanted a um, commitment ceremony because I, be I wanted to honor God and get married before God, but not in the law. You know what I'm saying? I feel like it just gets weird and technical. And what we do together, how we build together is ours. And if it don't work, you go your way, I go mine. We split what we've done together. I leave what I came with, you leave what you came with. Um, but then other times, like, okay, let's get married. I don't know. I still want my ring. Wh whichever way I do it, I need that ring, though, okay? <laughs> let's talk about the minimum eight carrots. Minimum eight. <laughs> uh, what did Jay-Z say? Rock so big, can't, can't even fit her hand in her new purse. I think... Critiques of legal marriage are fair. I remember watching this video of a divorce attorney and he says <laughs> that legal marriage fits the, def the definition of negligence because about 56% of them fail and there are really no safeguards in place. I think, you know, you can make the argument for men and women, but definitely for men, especially if kids are involved, alimony, child support, the whole nine. But I think it also speaks to Another part of the Peter Pan syndrome where it's like, we just want pageantry. We want the pageantry of love, not the reality. We want the pageantry of monogamy and marriage, not the reality. We want the wedding. We don't want the marriage. We want the butterflies. We want the excitement. We want the highs. We want the for better. We don't want the for worse. And that goes back to, I think, the immaturity with which we think about companionship. And, you know, in Sternberg's triangular theory of love, I think we're over-indexing on the passion and the intimacy and not thinking about the commitment. Mature love is about commitment. It's about despite how I feel, I have committed myself to this, to you. That's mature love. That's authentic love. That's sustainable love because feelings change. And in this lady's case, even though she's relatively attractive, especially for her age, once all those new butterflies wear off and, you know, the, the novelty of a new person and a beautiful woman wears off, that's what we're left with. And we need to prioritize thinking about that, not rings or ceremonies or dresses or pictures. That's the only thing that matters. I need the one that I like got to take off some days. My baby's just too big. It's just too 
big. <laughs> Everything's too big. <laughs> You know what I like about young men is that they're very confident. If they're like attracted to an older woman, those little boys be coming with some confidence. It's like, okay. They make you feel good about yourself. They they hype you up. And I think we do the same thing for them. Older women, it's like a, we stroke their ego. We make them feel more of a man. And it's like, they feel like they're conquering something. <clears throat> but little do you know, we conquering them. Speaking as a young dude who has, uh, you know, been involved with some older women in my day, you know, back in the day when, you know, I was moving and grooving. Um, one of the things that I did appreciate about older women is, you know, the conversation tended to be better. Right. They were especially as a young guy who I guess some people describe me as having an old soul. Um, it's it, it's difficult sometimes to relate to or be stimulated in conversation with people your age. And that's one thing that I appreciated about older women. I could learn something from them, right? Even shit that I didn't really care about, like furniture or fabrics, right? I was somebody who appreciated somebody who was, who I could nerd over things with, even things I didn't care about. So yeah, I always encourage young dudes, if, if you have the riz, yeah, yeah date, date some older women, um, learn something from them. However, keep your eye on the price, right? Still understand if you're somebody who's interested in legacy and she can't give that to you, um, don't be coerced into trapping yourself into a life that you really don't want. You know, to, to her point, these, these young men, they're not as uh, idiotic they might come across, and especially if she is gravitating towards the young fun men that might say something about maybe some immaturity in her. Because you will say the same thing about older dudes who date young women. We'll, we'll say, oh, he's probably immature. But when it comes to older women who date young men, especially the young men who are still in the club, popping bottles and doing all that young shit, we don't consider the fact that maybe she's immature. Even like the energy and like the fun, there's some 50s and 60 year olds that like, like to have fun, but I feel like my age range, like we're still young, we still have a lot of vigor, we like to go out, like to travel. I need somebody that can keep up with me because when I go out, like, especially out the country, I like to have a good time. And I'm out partying, I might be on the table, I don't need you to be embarrassed. Like I wanna have a good time. And I don't feel like sometimes like older people, they just wanna stay in the house all the time or want to do boring stuff. Like, I don't want to go play bingo. Where they say age ain't nothing but a number. Y'all love to use that line. I was like, age is more than number once we get down the line. Okay, we got to, right now it's all cute, but when we get to the nitty gritty and you start wanting babies and talking other things, I'm like, uh, I'm 40 years old. <laughs> to wrap this up, life is about balance, Life is about trade-offs. Life is about benefits and costs. If we are simply prioritizing our perspective without being thorough in our critiques of ourselves, without critiquing our expectations, without auditing our offerings to qualify for set expectations, it'll be very hard for us to attain the things that we want. And it tends to be easier for us to blame everybody but ourselves. So obviously I'm using uh, Crystal as a proxy because I don't know her personally, but um, I am seeing a lot of people, men and women, who instead of auditing the challenges that come along with being involved with them from the perspective of the other side, they would rather run with this narrative that they are God's gift and the issue is that people haven't been able to see that. As opposed to the reality that if you are somebody, I think particularly a woman who is desiring of monogamy and you've been un unsuccessful into the later post-wall years of your life, from the perspective of men, there might be something wrong with you. And since men are providers and protectors, our default is to assume the worst. So instead of just simply shaming us for 
not knowing how to handle a good woman or being intimidated or any of the other common talking points, maybe consider the fact that our assumption tends to be true. Thank you all for listening. Hit the like button. Make sure you subscribe. Check out some of the other content. And I'll see you all in the next one. Also, send me videos that you want me to revise. And uh, we'll keep this thing going. Peace out, y'all.